Good evening, bonsoir à tous. I am Anna Basile, Division Manager with Ottawa Public Library. We believe it is important to acknowledge that even as we gather virtually, we are on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. Nous rendons hommage à toutes les Premières Nations, les Inuit et les Métis, leurs aînés, leurs ancêtres et leurs importantes contributions passées et présentes. It is a pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Ottawa Public Library to this evening's program in partnership with the Ottawa International Writers Festival. Our guest author this evening is Jen Sukfong Lee. Her books include The Conjoined, which was nominated for the International Dublin Literary Award and was a finalist for the Ethel Wilson Fiction Prize. The Better Mother, a finalist for the City of Vancouver Book Award, as well as The End of East, Gentlemen of the Shade, and Chinese New Year. Jen currently teaches at the Writer's Studio Online with Simon Fraser University. She also edits fiction for Woolsack and Wynn Buckrider Books and co-hosts the literary podcast, Can't Lit. She is here tonight to discuss her latest book, The Shadow List, described by fellow Canadian writer Zoe Whittle as an addictive read from start to finish. It is not your typical book of poetry. Jen has a novelist's way with character in her work. She builds a deep connection with the narrator of the poems and each poem creates a vivid snapshot of moments most of us will recognize. Moments like the slick of black ice, the killing light of day, cheap plastic diamonds. They are all pieces of a life we gather and put in our pockets to remember. This evening's event is part of the library's Asian Heritage Month lineup. And we encourage you to visit our website for details on the various programs that we have on offer, as well as book lists and other resources. It is now my pleasure to hand things over to Sean Wilson, Artistic Director of the Ottawa International Writers Festival. Bon soir, good evening and enjoy. Thank you, Anna. Good evening, everyone. I am also broadcasting from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. And I'm so thrilled to welcome you all to the Writers' Festival's 2021 virtual season and to thank our friends at the Ottawa Public Library for their ongoing collaboration. I also want to thank you for supporting authors and booksellers through these difficult times. Our official bookseller is Perfect Books on Elgin Street, but I know that wherever you are right now, there's a fantastic independent bookseller nearby who would be more than happy to sell you some great books. Our spring season continues into June and it's all available online, free and on demand. So just visit writersfestival.org and click play. If you enjoy this event or any of our virtual programming, please consider making a charitable donation. Your financial support will allow us to continue to bring you the world's most interesting authors and thinkers, even as we continue our second year of the pandemic. Our host, Ellen Chang Richardson, is an award-winning poet with three chapbooks to her credit. She's also the founder of Little Birds Poetry and a member of the reading of the Poetry Collective Seven, as well as co-founder of Riverbed Reading Series, which kicks off its second season this Wednesday at 7.30 Eastern time. Let's give Ellen a warm virtual welcome. Thank you, Sean. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and kicking off um, the spring season of the Writers' Fest. I am also streaming in from Ottawa, Ontario, better known as the unceded ancestral territories of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. And uh, joining me tonight is Jen. Hi, Jen. Hello, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm so excited to be sitting down with you today. We're here to chat about like your debut poetry collection, which if you haven't picked it up yet, is called The Shadow List. Which way does it go? Nobody knows. <laughs> no, all sorts of ways, trust me, inside and out. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I do also hope that we can chat about other things too, including your newest children's book, which is also out recently. It's called Finding Home, The Journey of Immigrants and Refugees, both of which are available, everyone, from the Ottawa Public Library. I actually did a search and through your local independent. So before you start, 
actually. I would love for Jen to give us a five minute reading from her book. Please take yeah. it away. Let's do that. Um, the first, my poems can be quite long, so it's not going to be like many poems. It's just going to be a few. Um, my first one I'm going to read is called Infestation. In the kitchen, they hang upside down on the ceiling, wings folded, their bodies tucked like arrowheads, antennae quivering so slightly, you have to stand on a chair and squint to see any movement at all. In the bedroom, at night, they fly around your reading lamp, and you can hear their exoskeletons singe on the hot light bulb as you open book after book without finishing any. You burrow deep in your closet looking for abandoned cocoons in your sweater pile, open every container in your pantry until you find larvae in the quinoa. You swear they are pulsating like they already know how to breathe. It figures, you think, trying to eat healthy results in a plague. Steel cut oats, pearled barley, brown rice, all in their clear containers so they can judge you from within. You compost them without regret. The traps emit pheromones. You stay up half the night watching the moths circle the trap that smells like sex, the trap that will lure them in with the heady scent of moth desire. They will fly in, land on the adhesive and never escape. They last four, maybe five days before they stop struggling and die, their tiny moth feet covered in an unforgiving glue. This satisfies you. Where they have come from, you don't know, but you create an origin story in your head. The elderly Chinese couple next door, you think it must be them. Maybe they keep dry goods in their bedroom, drywall the only thing separating your headboard from theirs. You remember that time you cleaned out your mother's house and found a dozen bottles of soy sauce and seven packages of dried cloud ear fungus hidden behind the coats in the closet. What if there is a shelf of mung beans and jasmine rice right behind your pillows? There, the moths build cocoons, hatch, and then fly off into your open window, straight toward your bedside lamp. The moths know. This is why they have come to you, toward the only light in a dark building, toward the promise of sex and a long, sticky death. They know you read at night. They know you are alone. They know you itch with loneliness until you could scream, so you read and fail until you fall asleep. Um, so for this portion, I'm going to read, I think, one more poem, and then we'll get to five, mis five minutes. Uh, this one is called Detritus. I don't actually say that word out loud a lot. I'm never confident that I'm pronouncing it properly. I, it's okay. I think you're good. Okay. <laughs> that's actually one of, it's one of those words, right, that like nobody ever says out loud. No, uh, aluminum, aluminum, detritus, detritus. Detritus? Detritus. detritus. Divisive? So divisive? Sorry. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> In your son's pockets, you find the following. Maple leaves, dried, pebbles from the schoolyard, a dove feather, a plastic sapphire. Fallen, he whispers, from the queen's crown. What you never talk about. The glitter he once collected from the basement of your last house spilled across the concrete floor from a box of loose Christmas ornaments you dropped in your hurry to decorate a living room you knew you would soon leave. Then he had swept the sparkly dust into an egg cup with his chubby hands and placed it on the mantle, the same mantle you would punch during a fight that sparked a fire in your chest that burned through the sinews in your shoulders and arms until your knuckles hit the stained oak and you were left with swollen hands until New Year's Eve. Maybe the champagne fixed everything, but you know that's not true. Your chest aches when you think of that house, the tall ceilings, the plaster walls, cool to the touch. The egg cup sits on a shelf in your son's new room, Dusty now behind a pile of ball caps. If he ever looks at it, he doesn't say. I'm gonna stop there. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much. Some of my favorite lines from the two that you read are just drywall, the only thing that separates your headboard from theirs. Because mm -hmm. I've laid in my bed before and thought to myself, hmm, <laughs> what's going on on the other side? Just right there. My office is my bedroom, if anyone can see. So that's that's the drywall. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to get to that in a second, actually, that use of voice that's very just so straightforward. And so I don't want to use the word banal, but it's kind of like a good banal. You know what I mean? It's it's like a, a, this is matter of fact. And that's, you know, this is my life. And that's what we're going to you're gonna get into right now, which is part of the, my favorite stuff about narrative poetry, but we'll get there. Okay. I wanna start first with 
how you mentioned in a recent episode of Can't Lit, which I subscribe to, I love it, it's fun, <laughs> that setting is probably the most important tool for you when it comes to writing fiction and that it's a tool that you actually use quite a bit in this collection. I was wondering if you could touch upon that and how it fuels the undertones of the book. Yeah, I mean, for me, setting has always meant, I think all of my books, except for, you know, some of the kids' books have been set in Vancouver, um, what we know as Vancouver, which is actually the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations, I should say. Um, and um, Vancouver, to me, is a really curious place. It's, um, I always think of it as the last place that um, people go to before they fall off the edge of the world. Um, um, but also, it's a place where it's a port city so there's a long history of like um sort of resource economy and also um vice things like sex trafficking um drugs all of that stuff um but if you come to vancouver and you're just a visitor it's like beautiful right there's like beautiful tall glass towers the mountains are so blue the ocean is so blue everything's so nice and yet that undercurrent of um uh, poverty of, um, you know, the immigrant working class who can never really get anywhere, all of that is still there. So setting for me in Vancouver has always been really rich. And I think um, sort of the themes that I'm, I'm always sort of working around, which is, uh, you know, sort of um, class, but also like feminism and also uh, the body, all of that to me is so uh, obviously connected to setting. You know, if there is no setting, um, the setting always has to reflect whatever it is that my narrator or my character is thinking or feeling. And like Vancouver is really easy to pick a bunch of stuff that is like, you know, it rains a lot, you can be gloomy. Um, it's like, but it, you know, more than that too, I think that the setting can also, you know, change a person um, and really um, change how we see the world. It really changes how we even like, I think even kind of physically grow into our own bodies. So that's a very long-winded explanation for myself. I love it. I, that's what makes me think though, like, yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm currently in Ottawa and when people come to Ottawa and they visit, it's very quiet. It's a beautiful city. It's, um, you know, lots of nature interwoven, but underneath that, <laughs> So my day job is in criminal administration at the Ottawa courthouse. And okay. Interesting. <laughs> Drowning in paper is all I can say. So yeah, I, I get that. Um, you know, when you visit a place, and I've been to Vancouver before, it is very gorgeous. Like you're standing on the side of the pier and, and the, the Pacific wind is hitting your face and you're just looking out like, holy crap, this is beautiful. <laughs> and then you remember that maybe three streets down, you know, biggest site of terrible crime, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So, um, but I, I like that you really dive into that throughout your previous books, as well as in this, there's something in this new debut collection of, po it's your debut collection of poetry. <laughs> My debut collection at 44 years old. It can still be done, everyone. <laughs> um, it's very raw. And that's what drew me into it is it's very different from a lot of the other poetry that I'm reading these days in the sense that it is just so real. And that comes through through that narrator's voice. You know, I want to talk about that. It's AAPI, mm -hmm. Asian American Pacific Islander slash Asian slash South Asian slash Southeast Asian Heritage Month. Um, yay. <laughs> <laughs> we should be aware of the issues that face Asian communities, so 365 days yes. out of the year in my mind. But I do want to touch on how Asian writers like you and I are often corralled into this specific niche of having to talk about trauma or intergenerational trauma, or we might have to talk about more like soft orientalist things like, you know, tapestries and, and porcelain. <laughs> um, I'm pushing out of that mold. In my own writing a lot of writers that i know who are bipoc are also pushing out of that um and i love that your narrator here does that too can you talk a bit about that journey for yourself yeah that is that was a real journey for me like a long <laughs> journey like i when i started writing my first novel the end of east which is a multi-generational sort of immigrant trauma story in some ways and um 
I had never, as a younger, as a younger writer, I had never envisioned that that would be the sort of thing that I would write. It never occurred to me that I would. And what ended up happening is that it, it I started reimagining um, my grandparents' lives specifically. And then the book, as it turns out, was my alpha story and it came out. And then what just ended up happening is that novel fit in a lot of ways into what people wanted out of like Asian Canadian female writers specifically um, or you know women of the Asian diaspora so um, it it was useful for me at that point but there was I started writing a second novel that never got published and part of the reason it never got published is because there were no Asian themes in it um, we sent it out it got rejected and everybody declined it it was a very strange novel I was trying my hand at sort of this kind of like time travel specky sort of situation um, and you know maybe it's, it. no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, probably, it's probably good it didn't get it didn't get published because I don't think it was ready but it's fine um, sure. I, I was it was not I was not the right time for it but for me um, but then I went through this whole thing of like what have I been writing if this doesn't if this gets declined what on earth does you know, you know, an editor will say who declined it that it's not capitalizing on my audience and I should be writing on the themes that people expect me to write it on. And I thought, what does that even mean? And would you say that to like, I don't know, Chuck Palahniuk or would you say that to like Cormac McCarthy? I don't think you would. So then um, as time went on, I started to explore themes. Obviously, race is really important to me. Obviously, uh, my Chinese heritage is really important to me. Um, and I wanted to write books where, to echo what you said earlier, where our identity as racialized people is just, is matter of fact. It's, a, it's, it's, it's part of who we are. It's, we walk through lives. I walk through life with this face. Everybody knows I'm Asian. Like, it's not, I don't, I can't real pat, my son said to me recently, he said, hey, maybe that guy doesn't know you're Asian. And I said, I do think that's a possibility. This face is my face. I cannot change it. So um, uh, it was really funny. I thought it was cute. Um, but it, it's just that I, you know, with the conjoined even, it was very much there, you know, the, the characters in that are Chinese Canadian and it plays into, you know, their working class situation. But it's a very matter of fact sort of thing. And for the shadow list in particular, it was an experiment for me in terms of voice, would I be allowed to write poems where I don't ever say if my narrator is what race she is? It doesn't, it, it, it's not something I ever mention. Um, but for me, it was, um, I wanted her to be messy. I wanted her to make decisions that, you know, the reader would be reading and be like, no, don't do that. Don't, don't say <laughs> hi to that guy. Um, and I, and I wanted them to not to know that those kinds of, um, you know, like white female poets have been writing really messy kind of love poems or really messy kind of sexual poems for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't feel that Asian women were given that um, elasticity of theme as much. Um, and so I really wanted to try. Our reality. What's that? Where on the flip side, it's actually our reality. It actually is. The fetishization of Asian women is such a big thing. And I think that um, the shadow list really touches on the fetishization of our bodies, really, without ever saying so. And I think that it has to be, the reader has to do a little bit of work to sort of make that connection. Um, but I'm sort of like at the point in my career where I, it, it, it matters to me that, that I want my readers to do a little bit of work. I think when I was like 25, I was like, no, I'll give you all the answers. Here are all the answers. I'm so worried you're going to run away from my book. Um, but, you know, I've been around for a while now and I, I don't mind the idea of a reader trying a little more. And I feel like I'm in a position now where I can ask them to try a little more, you know, and I know that uh, in a lot of like sort of uh, Canadian literature spaces, I have, you know, some privilege because I've been around for a while. But so I think then it's my responsibility to push the envelope in terms of what Asian women are allowed to write or what readers will accept from us. You're blazing the path for us, man. I'm tr I, okay, yeah. <laughs> I, it's not quite that dramatic, but if you want to say that, that's fine. I'm just writing some poems. <laughs> you know what? I, I actually, I've been thinking a lot about representation over the past two days after I finished your book. And then I kind of like dove back into my childhood. And like, you know, I grew up in Oakville, Ontario. Okay. In the 1990s, Oakville, Ontario, very white bread suburb. And then I moved to Shanghai for eight years. And that was a culture shock. Yeah, for me. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. Um, but you know, I went back to like the movies that I was watching, and Charlie's Angels. That was one of my favorite movies of all time because Miss Lucy Liu 
blaze the path. And when it comes to writing, I'm like, I honestly, you are blazing the path. So thank you. Oh, well, that's <laughs> really nice other. of you to say. It's, it's <laughs> not just me though. And then I should totally like Others. acknowledge the, the female writers who came before me, like Evelyn Lau is mm-hmm. one of the most underrated Asian Canadian writers and Sky Lee and Larissa Lai. Um, I'm sure I'm missing somebody. Lydia Kwa, um, I could name a, a lot of uh, women that I really admire. And, and um, I wanna say actually that Disappearing Moon Cafe by Sky Lee, if you haven't read it, um, that to me busts the door down so that we were not just writing about like sad mahjong games and like dumplings. And so, yeah. <laughs> well, that club was really wonderful. Made I love that book. <laughs> I love it. Still. I actually really do. And Amy Tan is so badass and wonderful. Uh, <laughs> but it's, yeah, but that's not the only version of our story. That's all. No, it's yeah. true. Um, actually, I, I wanted to read, re- I'm so glad that you read Infestation as one of the first poems, actually the first poem, because when I was reading it, dried cloud air fungus hidden behind the coats in the closet. Two days ago, I was standing in the green fresh down the road from me, staring up at the white fungus, thinking to myself, why is it such a massive bag? Where am I going to put it in my kitchen? And then my girlfriend texts me and goes, why don't you put it in your front hall closet? <laughs> that is such a Chinese thing to say. Damn put it, it, put it beside your coats. It'll be fine. It'll taste better that way. <laughs> Moths will get it. No big deal. Um, moving on, though, I do feel that like this matter-of-fact existence weaves its way through your children's books too. You know, like I was thrilled to see animals of Chinese New Year and like Chinese New Year, a celebration for everyone. Like. You know, when I moved back to Canada, I didn't have a lot of Asian friends, actually. I'm just, you know, I lived in Toronto. I was in the fine art industry. It's not very Asian run. It's very white run. Um, But I had a lot of really great friends who were open to learning about Chinese New Year and then fell in love with the traditions of Chinese New Year. And I started giving them little home ball, little red packets. And one of them was like trying to find a fairy in Vancouver actually and forgot that he had no cash and then reached into his coat and pulled out the home ball with the eight dollars that I had put in there for him and he had the perfect fare for the ferry but it's you know I'm thrilled to see representation and more and more of it and you're one of many writers in Canada who are starting to write more stories and diverse stories for children Mm -hmm. and I would have died for that as a kid you know I hardly had any representation so I want to ask you to tell our audience a bit more about the reason that you started writing children's novels and the reason you continue to write them. Um, why you think, them. Yeah, like I mean, when I was younger, and you know, you go through this thing as a writer when you're, you know, uh, when you're doing events and stuff, people will always ask you, what is the book that shaped you as a child? And for me, it was always Harriet the Spy or Anne of Green Gables or The Secret Garden or whatever. Nobody like me in any of those books, right? Nobody looks like me, nobody with parents like mine. Um, and I and I started thinking about like, what kind of things do I want my son to see? He's 11 now. And um, I started thinking like, what are the myths that, or the stories or the, like the folk tales that um, the only way I knew about them was because my, my grandparents and my parents told them to me. They were never in our media. They were never, you know, they were never an NFB short, you know, like we got to see the log driver's waltz 5,000 times, but like, did we ever know what the Chinese heritage was of our I neighbors and friends? For a lion dance, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Just a lion dance. It could be on a log. That'd be fine well, too. That'd be fine. That'd be great. Throw in That's some maple syrup <laughs> and it'd be like a nice hybrid situation. But yeah. I, yeah, sure. But it was, so that was where I sort of go with that. And, and then also like, you know, the children's books that I was reading when I was growing up did not reflect my reality. I grew up in East Vancouver in a working class neighborhood, extremely diverse, like so diverse. I couldn't even like express, like um, if there were like waspy people, it was, it was the exception. Like it, we were very much like, you know, a lot of the dads worked down at the dock. A lot of the moms, you know, um, you know, gardened and they'd exchange like arugula and bok choy over the back fence and it would no one spoke English but that's fine um they were all friends anyway and I and I felt like this is this version of childhood could be as compelling as you know the New York City of Harriet the Spy right like why not um Mm -hmm. because for me it was somewhat magical those sorts of moments um but also like the last book that I published Finding Home about um immigration 
and refugees and displaced persons and stuff. Uh, that one was really important for me because um, there was a period of time there where migration um, was a big topic in the news and people were talking about legal and illegal migrants and things and in ways that were not actually real. <laughs> like it's not facts. And I thought children don't know the difference, right? They see it on the news and they're gonna be, that person's illegal and therefore bad. Um, but the, the reality is it's never illegal to seek asylum to look for safety and security. So um, I wanted to write that book to just be like really matter of fact about it. Listen, this is what the United Nations Refugee Agency says, and we should listen to them. They know what they're talking about. Um, and this is, you know, so that was really important for me and also to build a sort of like empathy for children. Um, I think children often are quite empathetic anyway, but um, I think what's harder for them to understand are people who, who look a bit different or who, um, you know, maybe have an accent or whatever. And I just really wanted to make sure that um, they understand that everybody actually at their core wants the same thing, which is, which is security and safety and happiness. And that's, once everybody understands that, it seems to be fine. But anyway, that was my whole thing with the kids' books. Sorry, that's my dog agreeing with me. <laughs> I love it. I'm obsessed with dogs. I want one. Eventually. You should get one. Yeah, dogs are great. <laughs> my, my partner has to finish his PhD first, one thing at a time. That's it's quite intense. That whole okay. Thing. Wise, very wise. <laughs> um, oh, God, your dog distracted me and I lost my train of thought. Sorry. That's okay. It, Rosie. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely okay. Um, yeah. Oh, what I was going to say actually is, yeah, you're your children's books have a strong political message to them, which is very important. I think, you know, start them young. Yes. Um, but it's also, they're beautifully illustrated. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so lucky. Finding Home, I think I have it here. If people want to look at the cover, is illustrated by uh, Drew Shannon, the artist Drew Shannon. And it's just the cutest cover I've ever seen in my life. Have you ever seen anything so cute? <laughs> It's welcoming. I love yeah. that, you know, yeah. and that's what the whole immigration system system. I say system. It's not really a thing, but it's like the program through the United Nations and that whole the concept of seeking asylum. You know, my parent, my fa my father sought asylum here, and that is part of it. It's that welcoming aspect, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is what I think defines a lot of the um, that's the other thing about um, uh, Canada and in particular and our refugee policies, they could always be better. But but our the welcoming aspect um, is one of the things that I think distinctly makes um, Canada Canadian. Mm -hmm. um, if people are looking for a definition, this place we call Canada anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to go back to the shadow list real quick. And I want to talk about the different sections. Yeah. I better look to see if I can remember how many sections there are. You've got three. Well, you've got a, the introduction. I actually count as its own section. Okay. That reminded me very much of uh, Ian Williams and how he has that one poem that goes throughout his entire book. It's pretty fabulous. I, I just I'm starting to love that the multi-page single poem with only a few lines because it's you know it's half blank space, half narrative. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to talk about you've got part one, part two, and part three without giving too much away because readers should go and pick up the book and experience it themselves how did you conceptualize the different parts of the book yeah you know what there was always these part divisions always existed i don't think they were ever really that different as soon as i knew it was going to be a book anyway um except there was a part there was a fourth part that my editor the lovely paul vermeer uh asked me to cut and he was definitely correct okay. it was not that good and uh and that's fine part of the shadow list there was a, the shadow of the shadow list it shall never see the light of day uh is what we're saying um but there was a fourth part but the fourth part was kind of a throwaway part and i'm glad we got rid of it but the the way that it works the way it's mostly laid out here in terms of order and like division is i think the way it had been for most of that time um and i was um there's a part one for me are these sort of like shorter poems. They're kind of, um, uh, they're a, little, a bit easier, I guess, to, to, they're less daunting, I think, than some of my longer poems can be. And then part two are these poems of really long lines. Um, the narrator is really going through some stuff. Um, she's making some, you know, some of those decisions that may not be super great. Mm -hmm. And she's, you know, going through her life. And then the third part for me was a little bit more outward. 
um, where, um, you know, I'm writing poems for uh, my old dog, for example, or like for um, some of my friends. And it, it, because I wanted to sort of have my narrator go on this journey where um, she, the way out of the shadows, as it were, if she, if, if, if she wanted to emerge is basically community in some ways um, and to look outward instead of constantly looking inward. I needed to give her a bit of a break, but also like the reader too, right? Those really long <laughs> poems in part two, I'm asking a lot. No, seriously though, I'm asking a lot from the reader and I want, and I wanted it to at the end for uh, my narrator to have a bit of lightness um, and look outward instead of constantly inward. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love that you mentioned that because that is how it feels, you know, and, and I wanted to wanted readers to hear that concept. How long did it take you to write this collection? I think I started writing some of the earliest poems, uh, gosh, probably 2014 ish. Uh, and then I was only writing them because so my son was really little then and I didn't know I didn't have like great pockets of time to like start a new novel that was one of the main things is i only had like you know the afternoon nap might last 45 minutes so what are you going to do um so i started writing these poems because i'm always writing anyway like even if it's stuff that's not going to go anywhere i feel really bereft if i'm not writing even if it's just little things um yep. <laughs> yeah so then i started writing these poems and then they i just kept writing them and they mm -hmm. were quite cohesive like the voice was the same um the settings were very much the same there was a lot of like uh, overlapping themes and sort of um, similar kinds of like circular logic and the narrator was so consistent um, so I just I just the at some point I must have been about 2017 I started thinking of it as a book um, and then I started like asking people to help me read it <laughs> will you read this poem please I know it's six pages long and I'm so sorry but please will you read this poem <laughs> every poet needs a reader yeah yeah. my poor best friend. <laughs> um, I actually want to turn the Q&A session to the crowd now, the audience. This is a live event after all. And if we were in a live space, aka two years ago, I'd be turning to all of you and asking if anyone had any burning questions for Jen. We're Do you miss that? Do you miss that? It being able to say, yes, the person in the back in the red shirt. <laughs> You know, I never got that opportunity. Everything that I've done has been since the pandemic started. <laughs> I'm like, I hope you get that opportunity. It's actually kind of fun. <laughs> Wait, Sean, take notes, okay? <laughs> um, okay, we've got a question from Mary, actually. And the question is, how did you first get published? Oh, like my first book or, oh, the first Let's book. do both. Let's do your very first publication ever. Yeah. Oh, you remember it. We all remember I do. it. Yeah. And the very first book, uh, my first real publication, like not the school newspaper, um, was in the Claremont Review. I believe it was 1994. I was 18 years old, um, and Claremont Review is a youth literary magazine that is published out of Victoria, um, and it's like a national like literary journal and everything. It's like a real publishing credit. And I was 18 years old, and my high school creative writing teacher, Allison Sullings, who I am still in contact with. Uh, suggested I send this particular poem uh, called Nerve Impulse. You see that? I even know the title of this poem. And uh, yeah, and I, I sent it and they published it. And um, it was really, this is back in the day, like I stuffed it in an envelope with a self-addressed uh, stamped envelope for them to return it to me. And I put it in the mail, like with a, with a letter and everything. And they got back to me six months later <laughs> it took forever <laughs> and then the and then the the journal came out you know six months after that um, and they sent me a copy in the mail um and then for my first novel uh so i had so this is before the in, like not before the internet but we would they were not accepting submissions via email and agents and editors didn't have websites like this just did, they just didn't so I went to like a directory, I think, or or the Quill Inquire at the library. I was definitely at the public library in Vancouver. And um, I made notes of the agents that I thought would be interested. There also weren't that many agents. So at the time, this was probably 2004, 2000, 2004-ish. Um, and uh, I sent query letters and a sample to five of them in the mail, again, with a self-addressed stamped envelope for its eventual return. Um, 
And I waited weeks and weeks and um, two agents actually phoned me and um, one of them was Carolyn Swayze and I ended up signing with her uh, because the other agent was going off on maternity leave and couldn't um, do it. Um, and then Carolyn, I was with her until about two, a year or two years ago and she retired. And now the other agent who went on maternity leave is now my agent now. So I've only ever had the in contact with two agents, Samantha Hayward. So um, ever That's in my life. Amazing. Actually. Yeah, it's funny. Um, and uh, yeah, so they, with the first novel, I think Carolyn took about maybe six months to it. No, it was probably about a year. She was probably submitting it for a year until Knopf picked it up. I was, I was very um, fortunate not to have to uh, be privy to all the rejections. <laughs> Bless her. Yeah. <laughs> I want to, okay, we've got another question, but I just want to backtrack real fast. So your first publication ever, ever was a poem. Mm -hmm. My first probably 10 were only, I only wrote poems up until I was like 24. <laughs> and now you've got your debut collection. There you Love. go. Full circle. Full circle. Okay. Next question is from Sean Wilson. Are there themes that work better as poems than prose or things you can say in a poem that would be difficult to include in a novel or story? Great question. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. So the thing about like these poems for me, they're like, a, they're, they were like a exercise in voice, um, in a novel, um, you know, you need a little bit more omniscience than, than, than what I was writing in the shadow list. And, um, you need a bit of more distance going to want to see where they are they want to know what the weather's like um they want to see what everyone's wearing they want like you know details right and there's a lot of stuff in a novel um and then for me with these poems i was it because it was such an exercise in voice for me there are a lot of things accessible when someone's speaking directly like emotions let's just say or sensory experiences um that are not quite as accessible in a novel like a novel's never going to be so tightly focused on voice. I mean, it could be, and if someone wants to write that novel, please send it to me and maybe I'll publish it. But like, I, you know, it's it, for me anyway, novels are not like that. And Take novels, notes, guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Novels for me are very much like an amalgamation of five or six ideas that seem connected. And they may not be connected to another person, but they're connected to me in my head. Um, whereas for me, these poems are very, like, so tightly focused, like, very singular in, in, in some ways. Hmm. That is the beauty of poetry, I mm -hmm. find, that, uh, you know, there is a sort of a zoning in that, I don't know. I, I'm not a novelist, though. I don't know if I ever have that capacity. <laughs> well, a novel, okay, you know what a novel is like? It's like a movie, right? Yeah. And then like a, like a poetry collection is more like a, a short. A, yeah, yeah, like a like a, do a documentary short subject, <laughs> <laughs> like a real, real short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> real precise. Yeah. And then a flash fiction is somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. um do we have any other questions from the audience yes this is from courtney i wonder if you could describe the poetry scene in vancouver seymour seymour Payne, who was here a few weeks ago provided a rich description of montreal's poetry scene oh the poetry scene in vancouver well there are a lot of poets in vancouver there are a lot of writers in vancouver actually in general um I find the poetry scene in Vancouver to be really fun. Um, there are a lot of um, poets um, uh, from different backgrounds, like cultural backgrounds. So like the BIPOC um, community of writers is really, really strong there. Um, we have, like I'm just thinking even about just uh, writers who've had uh, poetry collections out this season, like um, Selena Bowen, uh, Dallas Hunt, um, and then um, others from before, for like recent ones like David Lee or Shazia Hafiz Ramji, um, you know, all of these writers who are doing something really cool and really new um, and especially, um, and then we do have a lot of poets too who identify as a uh, queer or non-binary. Um, you know, we've got like Jay Simpson, um, Amber Dawn, um, just really fascinatingly diverse group of writers, which I really, really love. Everybody's writing, um, something very different. Like you have people who are writing like lyrical poetry, you have people who are writing like, you know, uh, experiments with erasure. Uh, you have people who are, everyone's doing something really, really different. Um, everyone's experimenting with language. Um, and the really interesting thing for me about Vancouver's poetry scene is that the BIPOC writers will often use words from other languages. And um, that is so exciting, like for me, like, like this to me is like, um, 
my my best dream made tangible into a book. Um, so yeah, so I think it's really cool. And then there are a lot of events in Vancouver too, like a lot of reading series, um, which back in the day you you could go to oh, meet no. people. No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, and then you also get like um, some of our elders will often show up at these things, you know, like a you know like Fred Waugh, I met him at one of these things, and George Bowring, and like all of, you know, Daphne Marlatt, like Betsy Warland. I mean, come on now, you get to meet your elders, the people whose poems you've been reading for years. So yeah, that's what I would say Vancouver's poetry scene is like. <laughs> also has incredible literary magazines. Yes. There are multiple that stem out of Vancouver, yeah. A lot of writers there, what are you gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> Publish great work. Yeah. All right, anyone else got a question or two? We're actually like really good on time. <laughs> I, I like didn't plan this properly. <laughs> I usually fly, but um, yeah, maybe that's the poet in me. I always am too short. Uh, no, short is good. Everyone's publishing real short books now. Have you have you seen like for example a brief history of my or a history of my brief body, Billy Ray Belcourt? It's so yeah. short. The essay uh, collection. I but actually so good with them to talk about it for Ottawa's Writers Fest, and then. Yeah. I finally, finally got my copy the other day. I'm like so stoked about it because Ellen has to go get it. <laughs> I have to get it because of this mushroom. And he actually pointed it out when we were talking to each other about it. But like I read it as a digital thing, and so I never got to hold it. Like I get got to hold. Luckily, yours came. Mm -hmm. It was a whole thing, but I got it. <laughs> so short books are, are good books. Thank often. goodness. That's good for me. <laughs> I've got a manuscript out there in the world and it's short. So let's fingers crossed. Um, Mary asks, what would you recommend for young writers trying to break in today? Um, I want you to write what compels you to write. First of all, um, I want you to uh, like whatever it is that puts your butt in the seat. That's what you're going to write. You're going to follow the narrative thread that compels you, the one that's drawing you forward. Um, I would also say that you I love to see um, emerging writers um, establish sustainable writing practice. And what I mean by sustainable is making sure that you're not forcing yourself to write at a time that's not good for you. Like when I was younger, I would force myself to write like at night because that was the only time I had. And um, I would not recommend that to anybody. It's not sustainable. So making sure that you find a writing practice that works for you and your life because your life matters too. Um, and also the other thing is just really important is community. Community is so, so, so important. So if, when the world opens up again um, and going to events in person, it's really important to be able to meet other people, like just people who are at your stage of, of uh, the process or people who are further along. Um, and I don't, I don't like to use the term networking because it feels like a burden um, and it's scary. <laughs> like the word networking is scary. Uh, what I mean is that um, it's really nice to make friends. And those friends are going to be the people that you turn to later when your manuscript is ready to be read by someone and you need some feedback. Or those friends are going to be um, maybe publishing an anthology or editing an anthology and they think, hey, your work is a really good fit for the themes that we're exploring. Um, so there's a reciprocity. Um, and then, you know, you're able also to give whatever you can give into the community too. So those three things I think are really, really important. You can Google like how to write a query letter, how to find an agent, you know, how to send something to an editor. And like those things are easily learnable, but like, I think these sort of like um, intangibles are really important and we shouldn't forget them. I'm agreeing a hundred percent. And if you're based in Ottawa, um, Mary as well. Ottawa has an incredibly supportive writing community. So when the lockdown ends in Ontario and we're all vaccinated, get in touch with us, come out. There's literally an event, or there used to be, and Sean knows this too, happening like every single night. I once triple booked myself in Ottawa, which <laughs> Toronto did not think that would be possible, but it worked. Okay, Courtney asks, are there any specific obstacles that female presenting Asian Canadian writers can expect to face that male presenting or white writers do not? Well, yeah, for sure. I think that oftentimes, I mean, I don't know, it doesn't happen to me as much anymore, but I think it, it happens because I'm older now, but I think for younger writers, it does happen like, um, you no know, one ever actually thinks you're the author when you show up at an event. <laughs> they just never do. They just, I don't know what, who they think you are, but they don't ever think you're the author. And they always look really surprised when you say, hi, my name is Jen. I'm reading tonight. 
Oh, there's a lot of that. Um, I think, I think that, um, the other thing is, is that you will always be asked about race and you will always be asked about identity. Um, and you will often be asked to do things like speak on diversity in publishing, whether you want to or not. And you will often be asked to speak on uh, the politics surrounding your identity, um, whether you want to or not. And, and I would say, um, don't do it if you feel the pressure, do it because you want to, or don't do it. And that's fine too. There is no one way to approach that and no one way to, you know, be an Asian woman walking through the world. Um, uh, and I and I do think that um, initially uh, the sort of like diversity of our narratives were not being represented in what was being published. We were being slotted into this Joylet Club situation as much as I love the Joylet Club. That's opening up now, I think. Um, the other thing, though, to watch out for, I think, is in the editing process. So I I think I'm I'm working on my tenth um, publishing contract, and I've only ever had one editor of color. So I think this is something with how many publishers now, I don't know, six, seven. Um, so that's something to look out for because there will be times when you feel like your interests um, are not perhaps being met, uh, that your, um, your editor may not quite get what you're doing um, or that you know further on in the process with like publicity and stuff, you, you may feel that some of these things that you're being asked to do events or interviews or whatever are exploitative and that does happen too so those are all the things that I would say to watch out for and also like yeah watch out for like yeah any of those things and then like also like with um events and stuff people will sometimes ask you really invasive questions about who you are um uh and you don't have to answer them that's my advice to you you don't have to answer them shut it down it's okay <laughs> I'm gonna piggyback off that how um how how have you found like what sort of tactics? This is I'm asking for me now. Um, I, I usually I usually make jokes. That's my tactic, but like like not everybody um, wants to do that, and that's fine. So like somebody <laughs> asked me not long ago, a couple of years ago, asked me like how much of your <laughs> so funny how much of your Chinese heritage um, contributes to your writing, and I said seventeen percent. All right, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I know it's like you just make it like yeah. I just. I don't have patience. Don't have right? Yeah, how much? I don't know. I don't like, know. Do I have a do I have an internal identity calculator? I don't you know, I'm it. taking notes over on the side here. <laughs> <laughs> like, and so generally that's what I would say. And then somebody else once asked me, like, don't you find that your work is derivative of Evelyn Laos? And I said, No, I actually don't think so, but you clearly do. So maybe you should answer the question. Ooh. Hi. Yeah, shut it down. <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone else got a burning question for Jen? We are actually almost at our end now. Um, I have room for one more question if anyone wants to ask it. And then I'm going to ask Jen to read from her book again. Don't which... be shy. I know I was talking about shutting down questions, but <laughs> don't be shy. Don't, that only happens like once every five years. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Uh, can I ask the typical question? Because I'm actually very interested. Yeah. What's next? Are you going to write a second, a second collection of poetry? Are you working on that novel of spec fic that never saw the light of day? Yeah, what's next? Eh? Uh, okay, so I have a collection of memoir essays that's coming out next year. So that's in, in edits currently called Super Fan. And it's about my relationship with pop culture and how it defined me as a person. Um, and then I have, I'm working on a, uh, a horror hybrid literary novel. Ooh. There's demons, like, Ooh. like demons with long skinny tongues and weird things. Like <laughs> What's that? Like Castlevania-ish? Mm, kind of, but like, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm going for more of like, you know, the movie, The Ring, that kind of, mm -hmm. but the Korean version, obviously, but like, yeah, like that, that kind of vibe. <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah Fill your eyes out all right thank you for sitting with us tonight jen you're welcome i, I would I, oh oh there's one last one all right one last burning question what's on your <laughs> nightstand right now oh oh it's uh i just i actually just finished it it's satellite love by genki ferguson um uh genki's first novel and it's about um there are several protagonists in it, but then sort of the, I would say the main protagonist is a young girl. She's probably about 16 named Anna who falls in love with a satellite in the sky and she names him Leo. It's really nice. It's good. It's a good book. <laughs> really cute. It's real cute. Yeah. 
satellite love. I'm going to have to write that down because that sounds like, I don't know. I just restarted Harry Potter because I sometimes like to read trash. Yeah. We all, we all have that, that compulsion sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But satellite love. Can I go on my it's, it's a really nice story, but there's like lots of pain and stuff in it too. And, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really finely written, deliberately written, I would say. All right. Can you read us three or four, oh, three or four poems? I'm going to read you one long poem. <laughs> <laughs> the, it's the last poem in the book, Stigmata. I like to end with this one sometimes. All right. All right here, here you have the mark of a witch. Turn your palms up, look closely at the middle. There, a star a stigmata from a past life when you were thrown into a winter cold river, left to stink if you were merely human, dragged out and hung for evil if you floated. The rapids were vicious, yet in your fists were sprigs of rosemary that you tore from the bush as the men carried you out of your cottage and through the garden. For memory, you thought, so they will not forget their shame. As you drowned, the jagged woody ends pierced the skin on your palms and you saw the blood swirl upward to the surface white swells, red wisps that spun like baby hair and then were gone. You listen to the woman who claims she has the sight. She asks, are you a conjurer? And you say to your surprise, yes. There were the imagined men you wrote into poems who then became real. There was the restlessness you wrote into your novel. And when your marriage died, you wondered what you had called into being. There is your father, your grandfather, and especially your grandmother. Once, well past midnight, you opened your eyes and the neighbor's porch light spilled over the edge of the bed. It was here your grandmother sat, perched like a gargoyle slowly coming to life. By then, she had been dead for 25 years. She said, they never knew me. They thought I was cruel. Silent, you watched her cry, transparent tears. You wondered if you should touch her, but you knew that your hand would open and close and grasp nothing at all. In the morning, you couldn't remember how she had left. Maybe she walked. Maybe she faded away. Maybe she kissed your forehead before flying out the window, nimble and weightless. Cradling your hands in her lap, the seer asks another question. Do you get everything you want? You hesitate. No. But yes? She looks at your face, eyes following the lines of your mouth, set hard in your jaw. Did he hurt you? Does he scare you? And you don't bother answering because you both already know. He hurt you many times on purpose and by accident. The intent never mattered. You resolve to write a poem that wishes him away, a place where the desert grows, grows truncated pine trees, bushes that are gray green against the dust rising every time a car passes on the two lane highway. He'd like it there. As far as the eye can see, he will be the tallest one. In the cramped living room, her three year old dancing to a cartoon on the television behind you, she traces your lifeline with her fingernail. So many slashes here and here. She takes a sip of water and then, were you a child? What happened? Before you can reply, she whispers, I'm so sorry. She turns your hand to the side. There is another marriage in your future. She smiles. This time you will be happy. He has been waiting for you. Someone is smoking weed in an upstairs bedroom and you blink against the smell. Well, you say, where can I find this man? She passes you a slice of apple taken from a plastic container shaped like a bunny's head and laughs. You're the witch. You tell me. And that's the end of that guy. <laughs> that's one of my favorite poems. Thank you. Thank you I just so made much. a noise with my straw, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Jen, for sitting down with me today and like answering so honestly and like going through basically your writing life with us. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to turn now to thank all of you who are with us tonight. If you haven't picked up a copy of The Shadow List yet, please do through indigo.ca or through your local independent or even through the publisher, we'll sec and win. Um, do they ship internationally? I feel like they do. I think they must. They must. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, go on a limb and say yes. <laughs> Check them out either way. Um, pick one up, you won't regret it. And thank you for joining us tonight. I think that's it. Thank you, everybody. That was awesome, Ellen. Thanks. Thank you.